all of these horizontal layers are laid down during the active flood in the first 150 days. All of these in the Grand Canyon go up to the middle of the flood and not through to the full end of the flood. And you have some deposition still taking place as the land began, as the waters are receding, the ocean basin sinking and the mountains rising, you have more runoff and you have more sediment that's being stripped off the land. And so some of the sediments that are higher up are formed in those stages when the water's decreasing, the mountains are rising. But these are all prior to that. These are all probably all the way up in the first 150 days in their deposits. So these are being deposited during the flood itself. Now, the Grand Canyon itself, the, the, the crack in the rocks, the, the eroding of this gorge is not part of the flood. The flood would lay down the deposits from side to side here. There was no canyon here. The canyon is formed after the flood, and it... Di various different theories as to when it formed, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Yes, great. Is there anything about the composition of the rocks and the different layers that would make sense that if it's heavier, so it would be laid down first? Uh, that was, I think, who, who asked that? Sergio. Sergio asked that, yes. Right, uh, the, the coarseness, the heaviness, uh, there are some that are like that, but there are others that aren't indicating there could be anomalies created by maybe a tsunami or a tectonic activity that took place that caused erosion of rougher rock later in the process. It's because it's an ongoing thing and it changes from time to time. All right. Now, look at that bottom layer, the Tapete Sandstone. Here is how it's so far been mapped across the continental United States. And this map I understand, is from 2006. And I'm told by geologists today that this map is now outdated because they've demonstrated that Tapitz is not only found here, it's found in Iceland, in Greenland, and in Europe. And there are others who say they've identified the exact same formation, although in different regions it takes different names. That's part of the difficulty. Because people in different regions describing the layers of rock give them different names. So there's no universal nomenclature. But when they go and check out the chemistry, they check out the physical uh, aspects of the deposit itself and its contents, and then its relationship to other layers, this layer has been identified now in Australia. It's been identified in Europe, Greenland, and Iceland, and we expect it to be found in many other places. That's that bottom layer that is right on top of the great unconformity. And uh, the unconformity, great unconformity, is known in some of the major canyons in China as well. And whether or not the bottom layer there is like the Tapitz or whether it's a different one, I don't know. But we, we would expect in some of the lower layers of the flood, the first to be deposited, that there would be areas that might not have the first few layers because the water has not yet submerged everything. And so there will be areas where you have a difference in uh, some of those layers being found. And by the way, this map is to show the extent of what has been mapped by means of drilling, by means of observation. It does not mean that it doesn't extend out into, say, Louisiana. It's just that no one has found it, evidence of it there yet. But as I said, 2006, they thought it would stop right here in the eastern United States. And now they found since then that it extends all the way to Greenland and to Iceland and into Europe. So that's, that's what we mean by these horizontal layers. Uh, how could this, I mean, these are water deposited. Everyone agrees these are water deposited. They are such an extent that it does not allow a local, flood, uh, a local flood process or theory in order to explain its existence. The contact points between Kaibab and Toraweep, as you see it here, you look there, it's an even knife edge here. And between Toraweep and Coconino, the Coconino is the lighter color. And notice how flat it is. Now, the variation here is partly due to faulting, where you have faults and uplifts, and you have a crack, and you have a fissure, and you'll have a change in some of the levels. So sometimes it's not exactly level because part of it has been pushed up through a later earthquake. 
we'll talk about earthquakes and things like that that occur during the flood or while there's still a lot of water in there, it creates a different force and has a different result. But you look at those contexts, there's no evidence of erosion. No evidence of erosion. And there are micro thin layers of the same thing all the way down through here. Are we to say that over millions of years, the coconino was deposited slowly, slowly, and identical materials throughout? It, that doesn't make sense either, to have identical materials, identical chemical composition, identical size of grains and characteristics. It just doesn't fit. It has to all be deposited at nearly the same instant. And especially when we end up with fossils in some of these that extend through many layers. The second point, the first point was global horizontal bedding of sedimentary deposits. The second is the contiguous surfaces are uneroded. We already mentioned that, but that is a major point. The horizontal layers as they are, are this way. As they should be, if there are millions of years, are this way, where you have constant erosion and a variation in the different levels. This is not what we see. This is not what you find. This is what we find. That also indicates that this happened rapidly, not over millions of years. Third point, these are all water deposited sediments, as we mentioned before, all water deposited. Why are so many different layers water deposited? Where did all the water come from? How could you have a movement of water that produced such thick sediments one after another so rapidly? What's the mechanism? Well, it makes sense to identify the mechanism as the flood of Noah's day. Again, looking at the Kaibab at the top there and the Torah Weep and the Torah Weep and Coconino and the Coconino and the Hermit Shale and the Hermit Shale and the Supai group. Uh, notice these layers, all very contiguous, very horizontal, very clean, and every one of these are water deposited. Now, there's one change here. The coconino here, that white, is said by secular scientists at the Grand Canyon to be wind deposited. Now, if we have wind deposition in the middle of the flood, you can't have a global flood, right? In other words, if they could prove that that's wind deposited, then our models of the flood depositing all of this just go out the window. It becomes a bonehead thing, <laughs> like we're talking about, right? But that coconino is fascinating because the coconino has a different layering system in it. It has the slanted beds of deposition that are inclined. And they're inclined at an average of about 20 degrees. Why is that significant? It's significant for this, that coconino cross bedding, that's what we call that cross bedding, like you see here at an angle, if it's wind created by dunes, it's created by wind blowing sand grains up and they're deposited on the front edge of the dune and the dune keeps advancing. We know that that occurs. We can watch the great sand dunes in Colorado. We can watch the Sahara Desert sand dunes. We can watch sand dunes even out here on the border of California and Arizona. We know that sand dunes do that, but the sand dunes, wind created dunes, have an angle of 30 to 34 degrees without fail, without exception. 30 to 34 degrees. Secondly, the content of the layers deposited by wind are silicon. They are rounded grains and they are uniform but the coconino doesn't fit any of those four qualities. The coconino is 20 to 27 degrees, never exceeds 27, rarely even reaches 27 degrees. It's made up of various minerals, including magnesium and many other parts of materials. 
It has angular grains of a variety of sizes, not rounded grains. They are non-uniform. That proves that the Coconino sandstone is water deposited, not wind deposited. And anyone who has a very small magnifying glass and goes up to the Coconino on the Grand Canyon can look at it and see it for themselves. It is obvious. But the secular literature insists on sticking with that these are wind created 30 to 34 degrees. You can take your own protractor and you can measure it yourself and you'll find out that it isn't. You can, if you have an idea of what silicon is, go down and gather some at the ocean down here, get some sand to take with you and compare it with what you see in the coconino you know, sandstone. Check to see if it's rounded grains like that. Check to see if they're uniform and you'll see, look at it and you'll say, no way. Absolutely not. It does not match. It is water deposited. Dr. John Whitmore of Cedarville College is a trained geologist with his PhD in geology from a secular university. He's the one who first began to question this layer and say, why are the, why are the scientists correct in saying that this is wind deposited? If so, here's what they themselves say are the factors involved in determining wind deposited sediments. And so he took those factors, went to the sandstone, started looking at it himself and discovered that very, very quickly that it was not. And then he thought, well, maybe I just looked at the wrong place. So he began looking everywhere the Coconino was exposed in over 220 miles length of the Grand Canyon. And he found no variation. The Coconino is identical throughout in every layer and discovered that the Coconino sandstone is found elsewhere in the United States. Went to those sites and found that they are still identical. None of them are wind deposited. They all fit the same categories in the yellow, not the ones in the white. Craig? Though, kind of a yes. Creating action, so they Correct. Down under the ocean and look for water yes. Dunes and what I'm glad you asked that. I think I have some slide here about it later, but let me get off on it now. Uh, Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado is one of those areas they have a flume, they call it, where they have a laboratory set up where they can take huge quantities of water and run it through a system where they can pour in sand, gravel, or whatever. They can color it. They can use different sizes of uh, materials, everything else. And they have observed and marked this exact same process in those flume experiments. Now there are flumes in major universities all over the world. There's one in South Africa that's confirmed it. There are ones in Germany that have confirmed it. There are ones in Australia and in Asia and Japan that have confirmed that this, they, they can confirm this and they can do the same thing with windblown sand experiments. It does not vary from this degree of angle. It is very pertinent to it. And they've also observed in these flumes how the water deposited sort things by coarseness, by size, by weight, etc. It is an amazing thing. And they're doing some amazing experiments. And they've gone uh, down to the Golden Gate uh, bridge up there in the San Francisco Bay Area, gone out in the ocean where you have all that from the American River and the force of water goes out in the ocean to look at what are formed there. They find dunes formed underwater there, water formed dunes. They can measure the angles. They can cut down in and measure the angles. They find the water forms 20 to 27 degrees. Never changes. Never changes. And they can actually watch and measure the development underwater of the water born, the water flow, as opposed to wind flow. There is the great unconformity. Right where he has his hand. This is tapete sandstone, and this is rock that is basement rock that is from down below, and it is totally different. That's the gap in which, and there, it looks like there's a gap, but that's only because there's been a little bit of erosion there by wind and rain and water and freezing water that have kind of emptied out that little gap a little bit. But that is the great unconformity where the secular scientist says 500 million to a billion years of material have disappeared. 
Now, peat sandstone is flood layer number one, the very first layer to be laid down. And the great unconformity, and then underneath that, the Vishnu group, which is a pre flood rock. Yes? What do they mean by disappeared? I don't understand what they're trying to say. They know that the amount of time that has to have been, uh, by their, their theory of evolutionary slow deposition, that there is a huge gap here in the rock record that they can't account for. First of all, because of the, as we saw before, this is a totally different type of rock down here. That total type of rock is just sliced off everywhere. And in addition, to, and by great force, there are places where you can see where uh, huge boulders have been broken off and you can actually walk upstream from the flow and you can find the place where it was broken off. You can go back to it, especially when you have uh, huge white rock crystals. Uh, some of them uh, as big as a house. They've been broken off and borne downstream by it and redeposited. And uh, it's, it's a terribly violent, totally different kind of rock. And also the fossil record that is down here. This is, this is uh, the rock that you'd find eventually some of the Cambrian explosion in in fossils. Totally different. Very, very different. And they believe that the, the Cambrian period had to be so far back, and then the pre-Cambrian, further back than that, by the time they put all their millions of years in, they measure this all out, and they say, and they also take the model of other layers that they can find in some places on the Earth that are below the great unconformity that aren't found here to where they say in the Grand Canyon at least, and in other places, equally large. I mean, when I say half billion to one billion years, some places the Grand Canyon will identify a billion year gap. Other places they'll identify a half billion year gap. Some places in the world they'll identify the same billion year gap, and some places a half billion year gap because of the different layers of rocks that are underneath it as opposed to what's on top. You can follow the Great Unconformity in the Grand Canyon. You can watch it. And as you go downstream, floating down the Colorado, you see it rise above you as the gorge goes deeper. And that's because we have an uplift, especially of the North Rim that took place. Later, we come back down to it when we get below that uplift. Yes. Question on that picture. Yes. There's horizontal layers underneath the great Yes. Well, notice that those horizontal layers, though, are at an angle. Notice how they come in here at an angle. They're not exactly horizontal, and they're broken off by that. And there are sedimentary rocks below the Great Unconformity. Uh, sedimentary rocks that have been laid down in pre-flood days. Perhaps at the rising of the dry land out of the water in Genesis 1. Perhaps in the rainstorms and other things that take place after that. And uh, those that would be horizontal... Uh, and have some of the same characteristics had to be quickly deposited. I took this picture because it fascinated me. If I were to stand here, my head would be about here and my feet down here. So we're looking here at about five feet here of a sand dune in the canyon. And this is what we would call a sandbar if it goes out into the water here. And these sand deposits along the sides of the Colorado River uh, have been, some of them deposited overnight. The fluctuation of water level and the bringing of sediments, some of these can be formed overnight. On this particular one, uh, by the testimony of the boatman, it wasn't there four years before at all. And so maximum four years' time to lay down all of these. Look at the horizontal layering. And note the way it's sculpted. It's exactly what you see on the greater walls of the Grand Canyon. This is the Grand Canyon in miniature. Sedimentary deposits deposited horizontally very rapidly with distinct horizontal layers, and then 
it has, because of the water flow, it has been cut. You have the same type of amphitheater effect. You have the same type of surfaces that are formed. You can look up the canyon walls and see the exact same type forms you see in that sand. Demonstrating it can be done very quickly, not over millions of years. And with identically the same superficial view of what you see as a result, showing the Grand Canyon is cut by water. It was first, all the layers were laid by water, and then later it was cut through by water. The mid flood point, Kaibab limestone. There are tracks in stone in Coconino sandstone in the Hermit Shale and the Supai group. There are nautiloid fossils in Redwall limestone. I'll talk about those in a minute and show you what they're like. The flood begins with a tapit sandstone, putting first layer down there on top of the great unconformity. The great unconformity again, the gap in material is that material has been stripped off by violent flood waters and then redeposited in these layers above it. Where did the material go to? Right there. It's in those layers. Where did the material go to for cutting the canyon? That's a different story entirely. You're sitting on top of the layers of sand and rock that were stripped from the Grand Canyon when the Grand Canyon were formed. The Colorado River brought all those sediments into the L.A. Basin. The L.A. Basin has all the sediments from, that were cut from the Grand Canyon. That tells you something else, too. That tells you that was quite a cut that took place and bore all that. That's a lot of water had to flow through there and break through the pass out here uh, by the uh, San Jacinto Mountains and out by Indio and uh, uh, Palm Springs and Palm Desert and bring that flow through here and deposit the sediments that once were in that Grand Canyon. In other words, what we have out here in these sediments are, are pieces of this material from these layers, broken off, jumbled together, and deposited here in the L.A. Basin. Next evidence, fossils. Some even in vertical orientation, like the nautiloids. Here are some fossil tracks in the Coconino sandstone. Very interesting, because it tells you that there are still some living animals almost halfway through the flood. These are animals that can navigate through water, and interestingly, the tracks here run at an angle, the direction of travel, and there's a slope. How do you know a slope? It's the same as if you go down to the beach and you walk up a slope of a sand dune on the beach. What do you see below your feet? You see the bottom part of your footprint is pushed out, right? It leaves a little bit of sand there. You have the same thing below each of these feet in the tracks. You can see where it pushed and the sand. Now, you did that at the beach. Do you think your fossil footprints are down there? No way. The only way that's done is if you're walking through it when there's water there and the water stays there and buries it immediately and very quickly with other sediment to preserve the formation and then solidify. Because otherwise you just have the water coming and going. It just wipes the, it, wipes it clean, clean slate. Footprints you made yesterday aren't there today. But if you walk through it with water coming up, at a rapid rate and a rapid deposition of more material coming immediately after so the water can't erode it away, then you'll have fossil footprints. And that's what we have here. The flow of water is, this is upslopes, the flow of water is this direction. It's flowing this way. They're going against the water. Uh, for some animals, that's the way they feed. For some animals, as in these, they may be trying to escape. These are nautiloid fossils, and uh, whoops, let me back up here. I don't know how well you can see it, but this is like a, uh, a squid. It's like the chambered nautilus, except the chambered nautilus is curled. You uncurl the chambered nautilus and you have all the chambers then as you look at it here through the tail here. Here's a break here, 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 here. 
here, here, and here, here, and here. This is the, the uh, uh, what we call the mouth of the nautiloid fossil. Its tail is back here. This is its body. This one is horizontal in the layer and has been trapped there and has been preserved. But others are vertical, like this one. The body goes up and down vertically here. And it's circular body, and it's marked out. You can see some of it here, aside from my yellow marking. You can see that. That is a vertical nautiloid. Now, when some of these are on an angle to where you can actually see the uh, body vertically, and that would mean that it could not be deposited over millions of years because a soft-bodied animal caught in sediment or dying, if it, the sediment builds up around it gradually, what will happen to the body? Decays or uh, animals eat it. It won't last. It's not going to sit there a million years to wait to be big, completely buried. So you have these bodies. Some of these are six feet in length that are vertical with at least six feet of vertical sediment having to be deposited immediately to preserve it in that shape. Had to be very rapid. Super, and by the way, those nonloid fossils are found in the, in the mouth of uh, the canyon as you go to St. George, Utah, the Virgin River Canyon. Just as you enter the canyon, just about, oh, a quarter of a mile in or so, there, the same nautiloid fossil bed is found there that is found in the Grand Canyon. They're found over tens of thousands of square miles. And in, a, in the uh, research about these nautiloid fossils, they found out what the density, approximate density is within the rock. And there are literally billions of these that were all buried simultaneously at the same time over tens of thousands of square miles in the identical event, the identical layer. Superfolds and giant folds. Here's a fold. I think, I don't know if I have a picture here of a man standing here, but if you have a man standing here, one of the pictures I have has a man, I think, standing over here, and he's about that high. This is a huge fold. What do you see about that fold that strikes you? Notice that it, if you look at the way the rock is, you have it come in here and then up and over and up and out. Caused, obviously, by a fault, an earthquake, a shift in the Earth's crust that raised part of it and cut off that horizontalness that you have. What do you see here that amazes you? Notice how it isn't all broken up. How do you bend solid rock? How are we told you can bend solid rock? Enough heat and enough pressure, you can bend rock. This is sedimentary rock. If you apply heat and pressure to sedimentary rock, what happens? Does something else. It turns into metamorphic rock. It changes form. It changes form. S metamorphic rock is caused by heat and pressure on sedimentary rock. This is still sediment. And it's not all fractured. You take rock like this, and this is hundreds of feet here that are involved, and you bend it. It's going to be totally shattered. Not just the shattering that you see here with, with the surface cracks here, because those are superficial. You go back in the rock, and some of it is very, very smooth. Same knife edges taking place all the way through. How can you bend layers and layers of rock like that? You can't. It has to be soft. While the water is still in it, while it's still pliable, the earthquake takes place and it bends. And in some places, it is more than just one layer of rock, talking about one kind of rock, but sometimes multiple, up to two or three different total layers of rock, some of them hundreds of feet thick, are simultaneously bent and curved like this in the Grand Canyon. Uh, where we take off from the helicopter at uh, Whitmore Wash, just around the corner from the helicopter pad, is a place there where you can see an S-shaped one 
that goes through two different types of rock, totally. And it's so smooth, you can't see any break. And it's all sedimentary rock. It had to have been bent while it was still filled with water, while it was saturated. And it bends like clay, very smooth. It's part of the proof and evidence that this is water deposited and that there was water in the uh, sediments. Huge boulders transported by water and mud. That boulder right there, this is my one liter water bottle sitting there. This was a picture I just took uh, three years ago in the Grand Canyon. It's, it's down at National Canyon or National Wash. The year before, this was not there. None of the debris was there. There was a campground here. That July, they had a huge flow of water and mud down National Canyon through a flash flood. This was brought down from a half mile upstream. This weighs hundreds of tons. It was borne on a mud flow, just carried along on a mud flow. All this debris was brought down with that. It was not there before, even underneath. They, they had all that area mapped out. They know all the secular geologists in the canyon will tell you this is all debris flow. That's how powerful these debris flows are. They can carry huge quantities of boulders. A uh, professor I had who was a missionary in China can remember uh, the gorges in China where he could hear after a heavy rainstorm the water flowing and he could hear like uh, dynamite going off the way the huge boulders being borne by the water would crash against each other down deep in the gorge. He said it was awe-inspiring. It was like thunder he could hear. The power of water. Well, water is powerful, but more powerful than water is a mud flow. A mud flow can carry far heavier objects farther and faster than water. Because water is a relatively thin medium compared to a mud flow. We walked up this canyon a ways to find out uh, where all of this had come from. And you could see where parts of the huge pieces had broken away from. And there were also debris flows up above. It was just an amazing thing. You can see this in a variety of locations, not just the Grand Canyon, but all over the world, this type of thing. And this was occurring in gigantic scale through the flood time. So the geological evidences, we mentioned the flumes for experimenting about deposition of sediments. Here's a picture of a flume and what it would look like in a laboratory. Here's several others where they do this kind of work. Uh, you can get uh, uh, pictures of these. You can get results. You can see some of the pictures of the type of deposits they get out of the flume experiments online. There's tons of material available there for you that confirm what we're saying about how the sediments were deposited in the Grand Canyon, confirming the cross bedding in the Coconino sandstone as being made by water, et cetera. It's all available there. Uh, therefore, the writer's intent in the biblical description, the biblical narrative of the flood, is that it was global and catastrophic. I mentioned Paul Seeley here because uh, several years back, I was involved in a debate with him uh, at ETS about the nature of the flood. And I probably already mentioned this to you, but I'll mention it again just in case you were missing or in case I didn't mention it since my mind is not as clear as it used to be. Um, but as we had the debate, we got to the end and we formed a panel. And the panel was for the purpose of each of us having a final brief statement and then opening it up to the floor for questions. The first question that came from the floor was directed at Paul Seeley. And uh, the question was this. Uh, if you don't accept a global catastrophic flood, then what in the world is the Bible talking about? And his response was, the Bible's talking about and describing exactly what Dr. Berwick has described. Wait a minute. Then why do you not believe in a global catastrophic flood? Because I don't accept what the Bible says. That was his statement. He's a former Westminster Seminary professor. That was his conclusion. Now, in the historical Adam debate that we had 
just in the past three years, last year in San Diego, the year before in Atlanta, we had the exact type of situation arise with John Walton, Dennis Lamaru, and uh, uh, C. John Collins, where at the very end in San Diego, someone asked the question, how can you say that Jesus acceded to a false view of an historical Adam? when he's supposed to know truth. How is it the Apostle Paul accepts historical Adam? And their response was, well, because he is a man in the first century AD and he knows only what scientists know in the first century AD, they didn't know any better. What does that say about Christ? That's saying he's purposely deceiving us by adapting himself, accommodating, they use the term accommodation, accommodating to a false view. And ultimately they said, why did Paul believe it then? Because that's what Genesis presents. That's what the Old Testament presents in the genealogy in First Chronicles, etc. So then how can you claim you believe in biblical inerrancy and say, this is what the Bible does teach, a historical Adam, but you don't believe in a historical Adam. Now, C. John Collins believes in a historical Adam, so he wasn't included at this point. It was primarily John Walton and Dennis Lamaru. And John Walton's response was, that's what the Bible says, that's not what I believe. You see, that's where we're at in this, even with the flood. Uh, the text supports it without the use of hyperbole. There's a significant impact from geological upheaval, just thinking naturally. Biblical and extra-biblical evidence confirm the writer's intent, intent. Everything we see out there in the geological nature, especially in the Grand Canyon, I can speak to that. I can speak to sediments I've seen in the Kali Gandaki Gorge in Nepal. Uh, I can speak to uh, the Snake River Gorge in Idaho. I can speak to the, uh, Grand, Can uh, the, the uh, Grand Canyon, the Yellowstone River in Yellowstone National Park. I can speak to the, the features we've seen in Israel and in Europe and in Asia where we've been in 34 different countries. In at least 10 of those countries, I've been, have, had the privilege to go into canyons or go into areas where I could see the, the layers of rocks and everything and confirm that this accounts for everything. We visited several archaeological sites and geological sites in Germany uh, about, uh, I guess now about 10 years ago. And as we went through those areas constantly, it just brought up again and again, this fits, this fits. It does not contradict anything we see elsewhere. It confirms the writer's intent. The extra biblical evidence interpreted through the bias of an anti-supernatural secular lens cannot trump the divinely revealed text. Secular science is not static. We've mentioned that before. Secular science applies an anti-supernaturalistic filter and faith system primarily. And here I should say secular scientists to be consistent with what I told you earlier. When the plain sense of the biblical text makes sense and is consistent with everything else in Scripture, seek no other sense. Very simple, basic hermeneutic to follow in these cases. This was the 2013 Christian leaders trip in the Grand Canyon. I'm going on the, uh, that was the seventh trip. The eighth trip was last year, and this year we're taking our ninth trip in the canyon. Uh, 187 miles of the canyon, and we go through there. Our director for uh, Canyon Ministries right now is John Albert here. Our geologist is Andrew Snelling, who works with uh, Answers in Genesis now. He got his geological training in the universities of Australia. And he worked for many years as a petroleum geologist for oil companies in Australia. And then when the Lord saved him, he took all that knowledge and began to apply it. And he's the one who wrote the revision of the Genesis flood by Whitcomb and Morris, now called in two volumes, Earth's Catastrophic Past. That's written by him. Uh, the former head of Canyon Ministries is Tom Vale. Tom was the one who started Canyon Ministries. Uh, he was a businessman here in Los Angeles. Uh, he had gone through a divorce. He was an unbeliever. He wanted a break. He wanted a vacation. He, the turmoil of life in Los Angeles got, got to him pretty badly. He went to visit the Grand Canyon on a vacation, 
got invited to be a boatman on one of the rafts because one of the boatmen didn't show up for the trip. And he loved it so much, he threw away his three-piece three piece suit and his Oxfords and adopted sandals and uh, uh, decided to stay in the Grand Canyon. And he's been in the Grand Canyon now for over 37 years. He began by leading trips through as a man who believed in evolution, as a man who accepted the geological model that secular scientists present. He presented the story as the National Park Service gives it. And then one day while he was in the Himalayas, reading the Gospel of John, the Lord spoke to him. And he, uh, in, in his reading of scripture, he became convicted that he did not know everything. And he said, this book has to begin somewhere. He turned to the book of Genesis and started reading in Genesis. And he said his first thought, even before he came by, to Christ by faith knowingly, he said his first thought was, this story is very different than what I tell in the Grand Canyon. A superficial first reading of the book of Genesis. A year later, he came to, or actually it was during that time, excuse me. He got trapped on the mountain uh, during a snor storm time. They were sitting in the tents for three days, couldn't go anywhere. He kept reading and reading. And this Bible had been given to him by a woman he met on a trip in the Grand Canyon. In the back of it was inscribed the sinner's prayer. And he said he read that prayer a hundred times before it really took root and really meant anything to him. Before he could say, I prayed that personally. But it was only after struggling through Genesis and parts of other parts of Scripture, all the Gospel of John and large parts of the New Testament, the Word of God is what converted him. And when he returned to the United States and began to think about the Grand Canyon from the very start, he said he knew on some of these trips that there were questions people were asking about things that could not fit the geological model given by the Park Service. He said now he had the answer. And so he sought out Christians who were geologists. Andrew Snelling was one of the first. Took him on trips to the canyon and said, you tell me what happened here. My Bible says something very differently happened than what I'm told in sec by secular scientists. Help me understand this from the Bible viewpoint. Is the Bible correct? If so, there should be some evidence here. Where is that evidence? And as a result, then a few years later, he established Canyon Ministries. I'm on the board of that ministry. And... Uh, in my retirement from full-time teaching, I'll be spending more time at the Grand Canyon, both in rafting trips and also in rim trips to uh, lead people through and give them a biblical perspective of the Grand Canyon. This was our trip last year uh, through the canyon. And uh, this is what it looks like when you put 16 people on a big rubber raft. Uh, where are the people? Well, you can see the edge of a hat right there. And part of the gear on the boat here, and this down here is actually a boatman at the back of the raft. Sometimes these holes we go into are so deep, that raft just goes down and you're covered. The water comes over, covers everything. Uh, it's a huge, huge river, huge rapids. You get plenty of wet. The water's about 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, I bathe in that every night, enjoy the freshness of it. We play at times. This is the Little Colorado River, an amazing place to play. Look at the color of the water. It's because of some calcium deposits on the bed of the river that reflect the blue sky. They're white calcium deposits. We form these chains, trains of people to go through some of the rapids on the Little Colorado trying to keep the train together. The goal is to beat out anyone else with the number of people you can keep on the train without breaking up going through. We've managed up to 19. We see bighorn rams, desert rams, every year. We're going to stop there because our time's up. There's many things we see. We'll talk a little bit more about this later on. We have a ball in there. I would hope that one of these days, some of you guys would come join us in the canyon, see some of it for yourselves, or bring your families and take a rim tour. We have south rim tour. We have a bus. We have people that lead, guides that lead these tours, half day and full day. And then we're, once we get settled out there, uh, and hopefully within the next two or three years, uh, then uh, we want to put together a four-day bus trip through the Grand Staircase, covering Zion, Bryce, Arches, as well as Grand Canyon, and help to explain all the things about the biblical viewpoint. So, Lord willing, you'll drop by and see us sometime.